Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Heather Meitner, and um, my role has been as a kind of a coach um, for Northern California counties in implementing signs of safety and trying to think about how we integrate that with SDM. Um, and um, I think that you guys are kind of a unique population in this practice, and we want to uh, get an opportunity today to kind of share with you both an overview of the signs of safety approach as well as uh, some of the unique pieces of the practice and then really hear from you and for you to share with each other uh, ways in which you think it might be applicable, worries that you might have about the practice, um, and how it might seamlessly integrate into your work. Um, so we'll be kind of covering um, the overview, um, a little information about interviewing kids and what they call the three houses approach. Um, to helping get the, the kids' perspective into the mapping and um, thinking about creating danger statements. And harm and danger statements are a really key part of this practice and that we minimize confusion for the family about why they're involved with the agency and what we hope for them to change, the real specific behaviors they need to change in order for them to be able to get us out of their lives and hopefully keep their kids and families safe. So my background uh, I was an ongoing social worker for the Department of Social Services in Massachusetts um, way back when, um, and I did that for several years, and it really did help me understand very clearly um, what Child Protection Services is about um, and how our work um, can really intervene to help families, and sometimes, unfortunately, it kind of prohibits families from moving forward in ways in which we can pay really close attention to how our intervention um, can benefit families versus, you know, create dependency and, and get in the way and things like that. Um, over time, I went back to school, got my master's in social work, um, and have been able to be in a variety of roles in our organization as a supervisor, a manager, a uh, meeting facilitator, and ta-da, trainer. Um, so I kind of currently wear, I'm a training manager in the organization now. I've been on the nonprofit side, so I've done the contract of procured services that we do for families. Um, and the prevention arm as well. So I feel like I bring kind of a wide variety to the, um, to the work and hopefully you guys um, will be able to share with me your perspective and we'll have a dialogue um, this morning. So um, Chelsea, I have us on from nine to 11, right? right? And so maybe we'll try to take a quick stretch break um, within that time. Please um, take care of yourselves. If you need to get up, use the restroom. Uh, what have you, feel free. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot a hand up. You know, you don't have to wait. This isn't, we don't want this to feel like a formal process at all. Um, so I just came from Lake County and had the opportunity to hang with them for two days. And it was a really enlightening and helpful uh, process. I really enjoyed getting to know the staff there um, and have started to learn the lingo in California. So I always have to check in to make sure that the part of the process or the words you guys use to describe the same thing we do. Um, so I'm getting better at that. So what's going to be really helpful for me throughout the two days that I'm here is to get a sense from each group kind of where your knowledge base is in this. How much exposure have you had to the practice? Maybe some of you have tried some of the skills out. Um, maybe you guys do this all the time, right? So everybody can be at a different place in their development around use of this practice. So from your perspective, um, this is a little scaling question, which is consistent with the solution-focused approach um, to the work. Um, how would you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being you've got little or no knowledge, 5 being some working knowledge of signs of safety, and 10 being a ton of knowledge and you're, you're starting to use the practice. So how many kind of in that like 1 to 3 range where you're just getting exposed, you're just hearing about it, okay, 3 to 5, where you've got some knowledge, yep, 5, 6, 7. Anybody want to come on up here with me and we can do some co-training? Okay, so I think we're all across the country, um, you know, different jurisdictions are implementing this or in different phases. I think, you know, when you have a large office um, in a county, you know, you really have varying kind of pockets of people that might be using it more than others. Um, so I kind of view this as just like we're all growing together, we're all figuring this out together. And, um, you know, it really is about adapting it to make sense for your style and your approach so that you feel comfortable um, trying it out. Um, so our desired outcomes are what we want to walk away with today. Um, so understanding and being able to articulate the principles of safety organized child protection practice. I mean, this is really about thinking about how we define words like danger and safety and risk and make sure we're kind of getting on the same page with that. Learning the different components of the signs of safety approach. Um, exposure to the practice of mapping. Have, has anybody been in a safety mapping? So anybody has no experience, never seen a safety mapping before? 
Okay, good. So um, being able to understand how that can help us organize the information that we have to collect, and then considering the strengths and dilemmas and in integrating signs of safety and the SDM practice, right? So we have this kind of signs of safety is really about our intuitive practice, and the structured decision-making tools is that in a little analytical way in which we're using kind of evidence about types of families that look like the family you're currently serving and checking that against one another. So it's kind of making our intuition and our clinical judgment match up against an analytical process. And sometimes it just doesn't feel like it totally gels. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So we just talked about some of the, um, the building blocks of SDM, and, and that really is about reliability, validity, where should our focus be on the case with each family, um, the transparency um, internally and externally about what is it that we're worried about and how do we want to um, assess the family's protective capacities as well as the things that aren't working well. Um, it really gives us amazing aggregate data. From a systemic perspective, SDM really helps us look at how we might be able uh, to look as a system at are we serving the right families at the right time. You know, when we talk about the risk assessment, low, moderate, high, or very high, we know statistically that families that are low and moderate risk, we don't really have much of an impact with our intervention in actually mitigating future maltreatment. Statistically, we're just not going to make a difference either way. Those families kind of go down the same trajectory with or without us. However, when we have a higher, very high risk case, we know that from a 50, I think it's 56 to 83 percent chance, bless you, um, of being able to minimize their likelihood of repeat maltreatment within 12 months. It's essential that we intervene. And we have a legal obligation, right, to intervene when a family um, has been reported. So it can inform our policy and programming as well. Um, because we only have two hours and we have a lot of information to cover, I'm probably not going to go through every single slide. Um, so if you have questions along the way, you know, pause me and, and we can stop and talk about it. So sometimes when um, new staff come on board, um, they see the SDM tool as a potential interviewing tool. So you guys know you can't sit down with a family, right, and go through that interviewing tool like it's a checklist. It really is for us to come back to the office and fill out an SDM form is a way of checking against what um, our gut instinct is telling us. And what is it like when you fill it out and it's exactly what you thought it should be? What does that tell us first as a social worker when you fill that out and your SDM tool comes out just the way you thought it would be? What's your experience with that? It doesn't always come out the same way. It doesn't always come out the same way. And that allows us to do what? So if you're telling, your gut's telling you this, this isn't that big of a deal, but this is saying it's a really high-risk case, what's that information going to provide for you? Well, I'm not going to get into that because it's always going to be higher mm -hmm. than what you're going to assess it at. Right. So that's information for us to consider that even though we're feeling like the family might not need the level of intervention that the tool is telling us, it's reminding us that all of those factors that led them to be high risk, whether it's their length of history with the agency, right? It's uh, every worker I know says, oh my God, they're so high because, well, of course they're going to be because they were involved three times before. And what we're have, we have to be reminded of is it's actually predicting the likelihood that they're higher risk because of that factor. So we just want to keep it in the back of our minds. It's not that this family can't change their behavior. It's not that we can't work with them. It's that the reality is, because of all those factors, we definitely, this family will benefit from being involved with us. And so making sure, you know, that we pay attention to what information the tool is telling us, and it's either going to validate our clinical judgment if we're right on the mark with what our worries are, or it's going to help us just pause and say, geez, why is there a difference between what I'm seeing here and what the tool is telling me? And so the signs of safety practice is a nice way to dovetail with that and allow us at decision-making points in time to just pause and kind of check our gut and what we're seeing and hearing up against what this tool can tell us. Um, sometimes the timing is interesting, right? So you fill out the tool after you get back to the office and you've already made the decision, right? And you kind of go, wow, this just feels like a waste of time. Um, and so being able to be clear about we don't want it to feel like just this rote check, check, check process, signs of safety and integrating with this is actually helping us take a step back and think about how SDM can serve us differently. So, you know, technology is an interesting thing. Anybody feel tethered to their desk, right? Like how many of you were workers pre-computer? 
right? And back in the day when you didn't have to worry about that, you could actually do good old fashioned social work because there wasn't the same level of emphasis on compliance and data entry. I remember sitting in court and that full day that I was sitting there waiting for the case to be called, I could catch up all my case notes because we wrote them on sheets of paper and stuck them in the case file. They never got entered into the system and I wasn't forced to have to go back to the office, sit at a computer and type. So it's really changed how we um, feel like we were case managers more than social workers because we don't have as much time to do the work with the families. Um, so just as a quick reiteration, um, these forms use very clinical language. They are um, internal documents for us um, and not language that we would use with the family. Um, and um, I'll skip that. Signs of safety was developed by a large number of folks who kind of keep building on the information that's been shared over time that helps us really kind of get back to good old fashioned social work about thinking about the time that we are sitting with the family. How do we spend it in a way that can be most effective to make you feel most effective as a social worker and to help the family streamline their process with us and get really clear really quickly about why we're involved and what we hope to see happen. So Andrew Turnell, um, is a guy from Western Australia who worked with Steve Edwards. And Steve Edwards was a social worker who was working with families. And Andrew was a therapist who was kind of serving those families. And the two of them started talking about the indigenous population, um, like tribal kids and families that they were working with. And there was such a disconnect. You know, he says, in our country, we have white fellas and black fellas. And the white fellas coming in to meet with the black fellas who were possibly hurting their kids it was a huge rub there. It was really, really hard to connect and for them to feel like they could make a practice really culturally appropriate for them. And the, the worries that they had were very, very serious. That, that very, very, very high percentage of their cases, I feel like it was over 90%, there was substance abuse, alcoholism, and sexual abuse. And so they were really worried about how to work with this group of folks in a way that didn't offend them, alienate and isolate them, and make them feel like they were being colonized, so to speak, in some way. So the paternalistic nature of our practice can sometimes get in the way um, for families connecting with us. And so they wanted to make sure that social workers found this practice useful and helpful. And that social workers were telling them and reporting back, this part of the practice works, this doesn't. And if it didn't, they'd throw it out. They didn't want it to be a top-down administration develops this, six layers removed, and then tells you to do it. So Sonia Parker got involved um, as somebody who started doing the piece around interviewing kids and helping us think about how we build networks with families. So we'll be talking about her work um, as well. And uh, UC Davis is bringing Sonia Parker to do some training here in the fall in September. So if you guys get a chance to go, she's remarkable and absolutely wonderful um, to get to see. So we are going with what social workers have already told us is effective. Um, and that's a key part of this practice. And the, the main objectives are about engagement, critical thinking, and enhancing safety. And the engagement is about if we don't have all the parties and all the stakeholders involved right from the get-go, we might be missing out on really important critical information, no matter what stage in the process we are. Critical thinking is about helping all the people consider the very ambiguous and complicated information and to sort it into meaningful child welfare categories. And what's essential is that we are not the only people critically thinking our way through the case. We want the families and all of their people to be critically thinking their way through the situations, not just us. And then lastly, it's about rigorous and sustainable on the ground child safety efforts. We wanna know that they come up with a plan that is not contingent and reliable on us. We don't want them to expect the department to keep kids and families safe. We want them to know the onus is on them to keep kids and families safe. So there's all these stages in this process and these are the signs of safety components. So some of you maybe have heard of all of them or just some of them, um, but we want you to think about Engagement first as solution-focused interviewing techniques, really finding out what's working well and doing more of it. Strategies for interviewing kids that includes the three houses and the safety house. And then critical thinking allows us to take the information that we collect and sort it by using the safety map. And there's a couple different ways that that can be done and we'll talk about that. And then lastly, how do we enhance the safety that's present there. If there's no safety present, obviously we have to intervene. So creating well-formed goals and danger statements, 
building safety networks through the safety circles activity, and then safety planning with the network and the children to make sure that there's a rigorous on the ground safety plan that's gonna last long after we're gone and out of the picture. As a social worker, when you meet a family and all their extended family comes, how does that make you feel? It's not just mom and the kids, you meet all these other people when you come out to the house. What information does that give you? Yeah, potential natural supports. Instantly, you, your anxiety can minimize a little bit if you meet these people and they seem like, wow, they really care. They're looking out for the kids' best interest, right? What else? When you meet folks. Something to build on to enhance safety in the future. Exactly, right? The families that we serve the most are really isolated most of the time. And they'll tell you, I have no one, right? How many times have you heard that? I don't have anybody else in my life. What we know through Kevin Campbell's work in family finding is that average American families have about 200 adult members um, in, their, in their family. And that usually our clients have alienated themselves from those folks. It's not that they don't exist, it's that there's some disconnect for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, usually it's their own behavior or their choice to use substances or whatever it is that's kind of pushed them away from their family. So our role can be to reconnect those folks centered around the best interest of the kids. So how many have had families go through a family group conference or family team decision making process? Right, so, so that's part of the prep work for that process is to really convince those family members who may have been estranged for some amount of time to be able to come back to the table because they care about the kids. And so that's a piece of this work that we're building on in Signs of Safety practice. What are the principles that underlie this? The principles are respecting service recipients as people worth doing business with. None of us should be in this business if we don't believe that families have the capacity to change and that they really do know more than anybody else what's going on um, in their own home. To cooperate with the person, not the abuse. Our threshold doesn't change. Our approach to this work has the same bottom line now in signs of safety that it did prior to signs of safety, right? We're upholding the safety of the kids. So we're not compromising in any way, shape, or form um, our uh, expectations of what needs to happen. It's about the approach and how we engage a family in the process that may or may not look slightly different. So recognizing that cooperation is possible even where coercion is required. What do you think I mean by that? I see smiles. I'm sensing you guys know what I mean by that. The court intervention for one. Yeah, yeah, There's, there could be legal implications, right, if families aren't able to uh, respond. Go ahead, what was that one? I said social work. Social work? Just telling people their options. Yeah, sharing their options with them. It's a skillful use of your authority, right? Because we have to always acknowledge the power differential when a government agency comes into a family's living room, right? That can be scary for them, and we understand the amount of power that we wield. And in the same token, we can't compromise that bottom line. There are certain non-negotiables, right, in our work. And so how we communicate that is important, but offering choices, like you said, is the key piece. You know, we understand about adult learning theory, right? Adults need to know the why um, of why they're learning, and they, they want to understand what their options are so that they can feel empowered to have, have those choices. Uh, remembering that all families have some signs of safety. You know, it's funny, over the years, we've always used the phrase, there's a safety concern, a safety threat, families are at risk, and those are kind of misnomers when you think about this definition of safety. So if we're looking for not just the absence of danger, we're looking for the presence of something. And that's the presence of safety. What makes you feel in the moment that you can walk out of that house and not take the children with you? What do you have to see, right, to feel comfortable? Because you make that safety and danger assessment every, every day in an instant, right? So we want to make sure that we're documenting the signs of safety, not just the signs of danger. It keeps the focus on enhancing future safety, right? So how many have had the family that denies that anything ever happened? Yep, does that happen like daily, weekly, right? So denied child abuse does not have to be a barrier to us engaging the family and really getting into a place with them where we can say, you know what, if you were me, pretend you work for the Child Protection Agency, right? And you got this report 
and it said this. This is what it said. Would you be willing to agree with me that if you were me, you'd be worried about this? So I didn't say you did it. I didn't say you had to admit it. I just said, could you agree that you'd be worried? Most families will come alongside, they'll take the bait, and they'll agree. Yep, I'd be worried if I heard that. But it didn't happen. I didn't do that. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. We're not going to get into the power struggle. What I need to know, sir, is that you're willing to partner with us and a group of people who care about your family in the future to enhance future safety. I don't want, and I think you don't want, anyone to ever feel the need to file a report like this again in the future. Would you be comfortable partnering with us so that we can make sure that that doesn't happen? See how I circumvented right around the power struggle? It's a really effective way that you can keep moving forward with families and not get stuck without asking them to admit that they did it. And it's interesting because some folks struggle with that and you guys might kind of have, like, it doesn't quite sit right, you know? And I think for me it's about why is it that we need them to admit and own it? Tell me from your perspective, what helps you when you know somebody's admitted that they've done something? Well, for the kids, I think it's been, uh, whether it's real or not, or uh, factual or not, that people who uh, have done something have to, and they want to change that behavior, have to admit that they've had that behavior. So in order to change something, admitting that you actually have that behavior is, would be the first step, whether or right. not. But we, throughout the years, um, People usually can't admit either because that puts them in a legal bind if yep. it's if they're extremely uh, risky or they just can't admit it. They're willing to change something, but um, identifying and actually saying it is beyond their capacity. So Great. So you hit the nail on the head. We expect insight before action. If they have some insight about it, they're more likely to, to change the behavior. But have you also had that client who was like, thank you so much, you're such a great social worker, you've really helped me understand I've got all these issues, and one of the biggest things is my drinking problem. You know, I know I'm an alcoholic, I'm going to AA now, I'm in counseling, you know, without you I, I couldn't be sober, and they're, they're giving you all these props. And then the very next week, they drive drunk with their kids in the car again. Have you had that happen? Right? So insight does not always connect to action. And we have found ourselves spinning in that little hamster wheel over the years. We feel better. I sleep better at night as a social worker when the family has owned the behavior or taken responsibility. Unfortunately, it does not guarantee that they are going to be any more likely to change a behavior. So what we want to do is communicate very effectively to families. Thank you for your admission. That's wonderful. Now we need a plan to change your behavior. And I need that plan to be monitored and verified by other people in your life. I don't want to be the only person who's responsible for monitoring that because I don't live there. And I don't want to live there, right? So how do we get the people who live near them, have proximity to them, et cetera, et cetera, to take that on, right? Because they care about those kids. And then they report back to us. That's the system that Signs of Safety Practice is trying to enact. So it really helps us figure out what is it the family wants to achieve? Is it aligned with what we want or are we way off, right? That's information for us if a family is able to say, yeah, I do want to change it and this is how I'm going to do it versus they don't see the problem at all, right? That's information and in how we're going to respond. And, you know, it really does treat the work as a forum for change. It allows us to constantly take that information in and figure out how we can act as, as catalysts to, to, to help them change. We're change agents for all practical purposes. Um, so the heart of signs of safety is collaboratively created, focus on goals, namely what the statutory agency needs to see to close a case. Right? At the end of the day, that's the bottom line. And we have to be able to figure out the family's ideas and ways to do that. And it has to work for the family or it's going to be a stalemate. There will be times when the agency is unable to fully support the specific, specific perspectives and wishes of the family, right? There's going to be times when we don't have exact agreement. But this approach creates a space to document and discuss both our plan and goal versus the family's if they don't align and we can't get on the same page. And when indicators of harm and danger outweigh the signs of safety, our intervention may be required, and this will always be part of the child protection role, right? So we have to take legal action um, in the event that the family is unable to rise to the occasion. So I want to give you a case example, and I want you to think about this um, through the lens of, of the work that you do. So this is about Cheryl, and Cheryl is a mom who has two girls, 
and she came to the department uh, when there was an emergency response because she had a suicide attempt by turning the gas in the stove in the kitchen while her girls were at home. So she was so desperate, she decides that she wants to end it, and that's what brought the case in. And so um, as we interview her and we find out more about her life, she shared that way back when she grew up in an abusive household where her father was very abusive and dangerous and her mother was um, abused um, and she was witness to that. She went into foster care when she was a child. She went on to have adult relationships that were riddled with domestic violence and then she had found herself very, very depressed and got into some treatment where they recommended medication and then she would go off the medication. Um, and so while off her medication, she lost her job and now she's in poverty and she doesn't know how she's gonna pay her bills. She's about to be evicted from her apartment and she's so desperate, she just wants it all to go away and she thinks, oh my God, I've completely repeated the cycle that my mother lived. I've become my mother. And she's so horrified that she decides to attempt on her life by turning on the gas while her girls are home. So what are your thoughts about that, about that situation? Did it require a child protection intervention? I'm seeing the nods, yes. Did it require an emergency response? Yes. So that's our initial assessment of this family. What do we know about danger as a result of that information? Right away, what comes to mind? What are your biggest worries about this family? she's going to kill herself and maybe her kids. Right. By turning the gas on when her kids were home, she exposed them, right, to harm, not just herself. Great. What else? What else worries you about Cheryl? She's unstable. Yep, she's unstable. What leads you to believe that she's unstable? Yep. So we don't know. Could she, could she do it again because she's so worried that now she's actually got her kids, you know, placed in care because of the choice that she made. Will she be that much more depressed, right? She's not on, her medication. She's not on her medication. And we're worried about her not being on her medication, right? What do we worry most about um, with her not being on her meds? Depression. The depression. Yep. The suicide. And how is that going to impact her parenting, right? There are a lot of de depressed people in the world, but they're not involved with child protection services unless they can't protect their kids, right? So we have worries about the, the, the impact, right, on those, on those kids. What do we know about safety? Has there been any, any clear understanding through that interview about ways in which she has protected her kids? Yep, she had been on meds at one point. Do you want to know more about that? Right, what else? What else do you want to know more about? At some point, she had a job and she was providing for them. Exactly, right? So that's a red flag for us to say, hmm, let's find out more about that. What else? It sounds like she's no longer in a relationship. Exactly. So that all your curiosity factors are starting to come to the surface where you want to find out, what do we know about safety? Because we know that the past patterns of harm is the number one prediction of future harm. And just like that, the past patterns of protection is the number one predictor of future protection. We want to know, are they balanced? Are they unbalanced, right? That kind of information is extremely helpful for you as you make an assessment. So while having a conversation with Cheryl, the, the interviewer asks, where were the girls when you, you made the suicide attempt? And she said, oh, well, I, I took the girls in the other room, in the living room, I opened up the window, I went back in, I shut the door between the kitchen and the living room, and then I turned the gas on on the stove. And he was like, wow, you, you took the girls and you put them in the next room. What made you choose to do that? Well, I didn't want my girls to be hurt. Okay, tell me more about that. So I opened the window in case the gas seeped into the living room, that there would be air in there and that they wouldn't get hurt. Now, when the response occurred, it was a neighbor who smelled the gas, called 911, and when the authorities got there, the girls had passed out. So, we're thrilled that she was thinking in the moment, and we want to acknowledge that. But are we gonna return the kids home right now? No, right? Of course not. But we wanna take a moment and explore that with her. What value does that have? in having a conversation with mom at this point in time where her kids are in care 
and she's been hospitalized and she's now in treatment for her suicide attempt. What's the value of, of making sure that we're acknowledging that she took the girls in the next, put them in the next room? Exactly. We want to think about how we can kind of meet her where she's at and help her recognize that there was a blip on that screen that was very, very positive, right? That she did not intend to kill her kids, right? That she was being the best mom she could be in that very desperate moment and at least took the time to put them in the other room. Had she not, what would have happened? They yeah, they could have died. She would have been arrested for child endangerment. She'd be going through this criminal prosecution. I mean, can you imagine that one thing that she did? And what else does that give to Cheryl by someone taking a moment to acknowledge that she did something that was that was right or better? What does that give her? Some hope. Hope. <coughs> hope. And we all know in our work if that the family feels totally hopeless right, they're not going to be able to move forward. So we want to be really mindful of the little glimmers of way in which we can give families hope. So then we start to get more information, right, all those curiosity things that you had. So we find out that when she was in that abusive situation as a little girl, her mom was so worried. She went to probate court and she gave custody to her aunt. She didn't get placed in foster care in the way that I assumed she did when I saw that up there. Did you think the same thing? There must have been an intervention by child protection and she must have been placed with a stranger? Turns out that wasn't the case. That was her mom being proactive and saying, I want to remove my daughter from this exposure. And so she gave her custody to the aunt. She still maintained her relationship with her mom. And her mom and her aunt made sure she got an education. And so she, at that point in time, wanted to give credit to, to both of her mom and her aunt for spending that time with her and encouraging her to get her education. She then you know, got married and the husband was abusive, but she decided finally to leave him because she didn't want her girls to be exposed to the same extent that she was. So she left her husband and she made sure during that period of time that she took appropriately care, cared for her girls by making sure that they were in school, that they went to the doctor, and that they were in therapy. She actually took her girls to therapy on her own because she was worried about their exposure to the domestic violence and she knew the impact that it had on her and she didn't want them to kind of repeat the cycle. Um, she also, and this is very interesting, now that the kids are placed in care, she's getting up at four o'clock in the morning, walking two miles across town to the other community where the kids are in, in the foster home and meeting them to get them off to school every single day. So the initial thought is, geez, does a social worker know about this, <laughs> right? Is that an arrangement that was approved and okay? What's the story here? Turns out it wasn't, right? So mom went to high school with the foster care provider and ne neither of them disclosed that to the agency. And so at that moment, you have to look at both sides and help her understand we have rules, policies, procedures, and that we need to have a conversation about that. But in and of itself, what's our opinion about her mate being that committed, right, to get up and go walk across town to get those girls up and off to school? What's the impact on the girls for her to come over and do that? It's very positive, right? So how do we get that on the books as something that's okay to do um, and talk about you know, ways in which that, that's benefiting the kids or in the event that it wasn't appropriate, that mom was coming there wreaking havoc every morning, we'd have a different opinion about that and take different action, right? In this case, we have evidence now of acts of protection over time that shift our thinking about Cheryl, right? Because what's really critical is now we know just as much about safety as we did about danger. We always want to have a full assessment. And unfortunately, sometimes in our work, if we only look at what's working well, it's naive practice, right? And we can't have that. You know, when strength-based approach to social work came out, we missed the boat a little bit as a nation on that. We didn't make the direct link between the safety being, mid being connected to mitigating or minimizing danger and risk. We have to immediately connect the dots between what those acts of protection are that keep kids safe over time versus just things that are nice, right? And um, um, kind of became fluff in the case files. So we have to make sure that when we're talking about safety, that it is safety that mitigates danger. And when we only look at the problems, Michael White, narrative therapist, calls that problem-saturated practice, right? What's the problem with that? 
What are we missing out if we only look at what's going wrong in a family? Ways to create safety in the future. Yeah. Ways to get the kids home. And to get out of their lives, right? We don't know when to close the case if we're not paying equal attention to what the family can do well. So that is, in my opinion, also naive practice. If we're just doing problem-saturated practice, we're missing the other half. So our role when we go out there, and as you guys, as first responders, you're the first people out there, being able to really look at getting the full assessment in a very short period of time, whether it's 24 hours, three days, or 10 days, how do we get the most full assessment about both what's working well and the things that are problematic so that we get a full assessment about the past, the present, and the future? So the three questions and signs of safety that help us get started are what are we worried about, what's going well, and what needs to happen next. They're very simplistic, they're easy to remember, and they're open-ended, right? So you, sky's the limit when you ask questions like that. The key thing is that we're not just asking them of ourselves, but we're asking them of the family and of all the collaterals, providers, partners, anybody who's involved and has access to this family that we can contact and find out. What is the school's perspective? What is the pediatrician's perspective? What is the neighbor's perspective? What is mom's mom, the maternal grandmother's perspective? What is the kid's perspective? So we want to make sure that we're asking those three questions of all the stakeholders involved with each case. Have you heard these three questions before in the signs of safety practice? Are you starting to you know, think that way a little bit more? Um, so what does that give us? When we talk about safety mapping, it gives us, when we get our worries um, listed, what's the harm, the danger, and the risk versus complicating factors, and how do they play a role in the case? What's going well can be sorted into signs of safety versus just supporting strengths, things that are really positive about the family's experience, but doesn't in and of themselves rise to the level of protecting the kids from danger and or our worries about the future. And then what needs to happen next, we can, once we get all that information organized, we can sift it down into a danger statement. And a harm and danger statement gets really clear about what's the past harm caused by a caregiver that led to a specific bad uh, or negative impact on the kids. And how do we identify a safety network to set some goals and do some planning in a way that they're going to mitigate that danger as a system with that family? And that network may have some professional folks involved. And more importantly, we want the informal support network, people who are in their life because it's by choice, not just their job, so that they can then carry out that plan long after we're gone. When you close a case out, or it gets closed out within the first 30 to 60 days or so with the organization, we feel so much better when they can articulate if this harm presents itself in the future, they have a plan to handle it. So let's say it's a mom's boyfriend who's the perpetrator, right? And he's been physically abusive to her children. And so she's made a choice to separate herself from him, not because we forced her to, but because she chose it. And if she chose that and he comes back, we want to know she has a plan that's going to keep him from having access to her kids, right? If we take the time to talk about that during our involvement, we are less likely for them to have a frequent flyer card in our program. Right? We don't want them to come back again within the next week, month, year, et cetera. So this is the piece of the practice that really requires the rigor that we may or may not have paid attention to um, as closely up until this point. So the words we use matter, and how we define each of these things is really important for us as a system to get on the same page. If I did an exercise with you and asked each of you to go around and define harm, danger, safety, risk, we would probably have you know, 15 different definitions. It's just human nature, it's how, it's how it works. So this gives us a chance to share our definitions and share meaning about words, and then hopefully help the family understand how their behaviors fit or not into each category. So the first word is harm, and that's past actions by a caregiver to a child that have hurt the child physically, developmentally, or emotionally. So harm is past. That's what you gotta remember, that's your kind of key takeaway. Danger is the credible worries and concerns child welfare and others in the community have about actions that the caregiver may be taking now or in the future that will harm that child, right? So we have to kind of think about if there's something happening right this minute that's dangerous or something that could happen within the next day, week, month, 
That's the danger that we're worried about. Risk is the likelihood that that danger will occur. It's the likelihood of future maltreatment. So I think it's really important for us to remember that danger and risk are not on a continuum. And somehow I think we forget that. So it's really danger and safety that are the polar opposites, right? So danger is the harm in the past and the future worries. about negative caregiver behavior. Safety is the presence, not just the absence of danger. It's the actual presence of acts of protection by a caregiver. And this is the key, demonstrated over time. You can't do right once, and then that's enough for us. We want to make sure that it's a new pattern of behavior, not just something you've tried out once and, oh, you can close the case now, right? We want to make sure that it's demonstrated. And that piece about being over time is really, really critical. So where's risk? Risk is the likelihood that either of these things will happen. Are they at risk of getting acts of protection? We want that. Versus is there risk about the future worries and the likelihood that that's going to happen? How worried are we is the risk. And if we are really worried and the family's not, that's information for us. If the family's worried and we're worried, that's also information with, uh, for us, right? So we want to make sure that we're paying attention to just not what we're worried about, but how worried are we that this is going to happen again in the future. Does that make sense to everybody? Questions about that? Does it feel consistent with your thinking, or does it shift it a little bit? Are there nuances here that make this slightly different? Anyone? I have. Yeah, right? That's where my, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to think about, geez, what I'm focusing on with this family really, really matters if we should be super worried about this versus the worry level is low. So call it your worry meter, you know, like does it go way up or is it kind of down here? And we're going to respond differently to that family depending on that, especially if their worry meter is right where ours is. You know, if you can ask a family what they're worried about and they're worried about the same things we are, fantastic or they're worried about things that are similar to what we're worried about but not exact we can kind of work with that the presence of safety over time is something families don't necessarily think about we use a lot of jargon words I had a worker say to me the other day the word supervision seems universal to me like that we would all know what it means to supervise a child she said well I had this mom who kept saying I don't understand why I keep getting these reports that I'm not supervising my kid I am home all day with my children. Well, her children are two and four. To be home is wonderful. To be in the same room is a little bit more important when you have toddlers, right? See the difference? She didn't connect the dots between physically being in the house versus being in eye shot of those kids and having her eyes on them. Yes? Um, I know you didn't get to it, but just to help me wrap my head, the risk and measurement of risk, you know, I mean, there's this, the thing that needs that we need to get is you know, how to measure risk. So are you thinking about it in terms of scaling? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that Andrew Turnell did when he did the safety mapping was he created a scaling question that he called a judgment question. Judgment is how worried are we? Not we're judging this family that they're bad people, but we're judging the situation. And so how worried are we on a scale of zero to 10? Zero being there is total safety, we don't, oh no, I'm sorry, zero being we have total danger and we have to pull the kids, 10 being it's total safety and we can leave the kids home, close the case, return kids home, et cetera. So he had a safety measurement scale and zero is no safety, 10 is, is complete safety. And we would ask the family, we would ask the providers and we would ask ourselves to scale that. If all three parties are in three different places, 
So say the department gives it, you know, a two, the family says it's a seven, and the provider's like in the five range, that's information for us to have a conversation. Geez, family, why do you think there's a discrepancy that myself as your social worker is really worried and I gave you a two, and you're saying there's a seven? That's gonna open up the dialogue for us to figure out concretely what are the behaviors that are going on, what's happening in the household, not just that we're abstractly dealing with this information. Then we take it from the abstract to the concrete, and we can really get specific about what would it take to get us closer together. When a family rates their safety as a four, what would it take to make it a five? That gives us an opportunity to measure progress each time we speak with them. And if they're able to articulate what it would take, we have got action plans right there, right? Interim case plan information. We've got an opportunity to create a safety plan that says, Right now, today, I'm leaving these kids because you're going to do these three things to mitigate that danger, and I can walk out without your children. And if we have verification, especially from other people, other members of the family, neighbors, landlord, best friend, whoever they want to bring to the table, we feel even more validated in our decision to, to allow that situation to occur. So this is about content of worry and level of worry, right? So the SDM tool, this is one of those points in time right, the safety and danger assessment, risk assessment, that gives us information, not just about what we're worried about, but how worried should we be, so that we're making sure that we're not leaving kids in a situation where they might not be protected. So we have to be able to get really concrete with the family about what we believe has occurred, and we wanna make sure that they get the nexus between their actions and the impact on the kids. I had a safety mapping session with a family a couple weeks ago, and this is a family who had had one prior involvement, actually multiple prior involvements uh, with the agency, some in different counties. And they, um, they stated that they have trouble with alcohol. And predominantly, um, mom, I think, um, abuses her Klonopin prescription medication. So they would drink while they were caring for their kids, and it's a problem. So this time, they were drinking, and they were like, oh, the social worker said last time, we gotta do something with the kids. So they drove the kids to the YMCA, drunk, to the program, <laughs> dropped them off at a three-hour afternoon program on a Saturday, drank for that three hours, and then went back to pick them up. And the Y released the kids to these parents, and they drove home. The parents got, they were so, I mean, almost on the verge of blackout, so in oblivion, got in a huge fight becomes this altercation that's scary to the kids. The eight-year-old picks up the phone and calls 911 and says, my parents are fighting, you know, we're scared. Please come get us. Emergency response worker gets called out on the weekend. They go to the home. They understand this family has history with us and they're an open case. And so we know that grandma and grandpa, mater or paternal grandparents are approved placement resource for this home. So these kids go to grandma and grandpa's. We have to petition right, detain these kids, take them, we end up with custody, and now it's a couple months later and we're meeting with the family to talk about what are the next steps gonna be. And so for the parents to then be able to understand the impact of their behavior on the kids is really, really clear. Dad definitely could articulate it. He could come up with multiple examples of how it put the kids at risk, but mom wasn't really engaged in this conversation. She wasn't totally getting it. And I asked her point blank, what happens, what are your kids doing when you're drunk. And she had the longest pause and she was staring up at the ceiling and she was really thinking about it. And she had this epiphany and she goes, oh my God, they can do whatever they want. And I said, okay. And is that good or bad? And she said, that would be bad. <laughs> okay, great. What are some of the things your kids have been able to do when you're under the influence of alcohol? Oh my God, they've eaten us out of house and home, they go out in the street, they're unsupervised, they don't do their homework. And she started to get into the things that were kind of low level risk, moderate risk. And then the high risk part was the emotional impact. Your kids were scared enough to call 911 because you were fighting and they were exposed to the violence in the home. And that's when mom had the big ringer and said, oh my God, I don't want my kids to grow up being fearful. So we had that little breakthrough. The next step is how do we then apply that to what the behaviors have to look like instead? 
right? Not telling them what not to do, instead telling them what they should be doing with their time and importantly in caregiving roles with the kids, right? So caregiver behavior impact. That's the key is to help the family come to the nexus, right? Making sure that we always look at the signs of safety and that we're really eliciting that from the family, right? So that they're sharing that with us. Now we haven't really talked that much about complicating factors. This is literally anything that complicates the work with the family that's not direct harm. Having bipolar as a diagnosis is a complicating factor. If your bipolar affects your ability to parent the kids, it could rise to something dangerous or harmful, right? But in and of itself, being bipolar doesn't mean you're gonna abuse your kids. Because otherwise, parents would think that they have to cure their bipolar in order to get the department out of their life. And that's not gonna happen, is it? But how many of our parents may feel that way inadvertently because it just seems like all you ever want me to do is get treatment and get on my meds. We want that if indeed it is going to help them change their behavior in a way that makes them a more effective parent and keeping their kids safe. That's where we always have to make the link, right? So making sure that we're not getting caught up in the things that are messy and stressful if they don't in and of themselves create harm for the kids. Because sometimes families are good at sucking us into the vortex, right? That, that horrible black hole where you literally spend an hour at the home and you've got five minutes to get a word in edgewise because they're, it's my clinical term, I call it leaking everything all over you. So how do we help them stay focused, right? Engaged in the time that we're together and get clear about where you're going to talk about all the things that directly impact the kids. You know, some um, families, the marital conflict is the biggest issue. Dad's calling you to whine about mom, and mom's calling you to report something about dad, and it's like your voicemail fills up every day with this stuff. Helping families recognize that's not our role. We do not want any part of their marital conflict. We're here to help them get it together and keep their kids safe, and that they've got to find another way to work that out. It's not our job to be marriage counselor or mediator every day of the week. So really getting focused on the things that are complicating factors. Just because someone's a teen parent doesn't automatically imply they won't know how to parent and they can't do it well, right? It's a complicating factor. Statistically, we know they're gonna face some challenges that older parents wouldn't, but it's not a reason to put kids in care, right? Having poverty issues is not a reason we put kids in care. It complicates the situation and it makes it messier for us, but in and of itself, we're not gonna put kids in care. Having low IQ, right, cognitive limitations, right, families that are cognitively limited, limited and have kind of a lower ceiling of understanding, that can complicate our work and the family situation, but doesn't automatically imply they can't parent their kids. So our job is to make sure that we're connecting the dots between what it is that's going on for the family and how it impacts the kids. If you can make a connection between an impact of these issues and the kids, we want to describe the behaviors then right, that lead to this being harmful. But in and of itself, that's not our biggest issue, right? So mom doesn't have to have a job necessarily. She has to be able to provide for her kids. She might find alternative means to provide for her kids, right? Getting on assistance, getting um, food stamps, having family members help out, right? So we have to be clear about exactly for each individual family what the connection is. Questions about that? Okay. Supporting strengths on the opposite side. Things that are really valuable about this family. Good qualities, positive attributes. Maybe their, their culture or their faith or their family connections provide support for them. But if those supports aren't actively taking care of safety for their kids, they're just supporting strengths. And we can build on those and we can have our providers build on those, right? Going to therapy might be helpful for this family if and only if we can articulate what their therapeutic goals are that are directly connected to keeping kids safe. If they're just going to therapy to then get the attendance check so that you get a report back that they went, does that really help us in the long run? It doesn't. It doesn't. We wish it did. It would be nice if it did, but it really, really doesn't. Right? Just because a youth is organized and exercised and is, is, is good at school and sports doesn't necessarily mean right, they're going to be able to be independent and take good care of themselves once they age out of our system. So we have to be really mindful about what's a strength versus what would it take to rise to an act of protection and so that we're getting really clear. 
So this is the safety map. And the map is just kind of a pictorial way that we organize the information. And I have a couple of examples. And I realize this didn't print well on your handouts, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's just one of those kind of freakish things with these PowerPoints sometimes when they print. Um, but what we want to do is get our list of worries. And the second one is the three column way in which this is the way Andrew Trinnell does it with a family. Because when we do an internal mapping, this grid seems to be more helpful for us. When we do it with a family, really we're starting with this. And we're saying, let's list all the things that we're worried about. And that's the capital we, right, everybody. All the things that are working well. And we want to connect them, working well relative to keeping kids safe, not just general things. And then what needs to happen next, right? So most importantly, getting those two columns filled out. And then we can shift in our own mind what are we most worried about? Helping the family prioritize the things that are scary right now in their family. So that actually naturally sorts the difference between harm and danger and complicating factors. If you're circling the top three, four things, right, we are all at least putting our attention and focus in the same place. So you've got, you know, let's say 40 minutes with a family and you're in their living room and you've just gotten a new report, right? Being able to say to the family, what are you most worried about because this is what the reporter was most worried about and now that I'm here this is what I'm most worried about you can streamline your interaction with the family to cut to the chase and get right to what those things are that feel like they're worrisome now tell me what's working well right one of the solution focused questions is called the exception question tell me about a time when you wanted to hit your child with the belt to control his behavior and you didn't do it Tell me about times when you feel really competent and good as a parent and you can manage his behaviors. Tell me about a time when the perpetrator came to the door and you sent him away instead of allowing him to come in and hurt your kids. Right, so getting the exceptions when the problem is not happening. Because most families, the problem's not happening more often than it is happening. And we want to get a sense of what are the conditions, what are the circumstances, who's present, and what has occurred to allow them to be that effective. Oh, geez, you didn't hit him that day when you took your medication. Tell me more about that, right? So then we start to help them connect the dots between when they're on their medication, they manage the child's behaviors differently than when they're not. So it's not about taking the meds. It's about taking the meds because it makes you a better parent. And that's something that sometimes our parents forget, right? How many times have you had the parents, they get on the meds, it's a good three months, they're doing really well, they're functioning much more highly, and they're a better parent. And then they go, wow, I'm good. It's, this is working. I'm, I'm cured. And then what do they do? They go off the medication. Exactly. And the whole point was that they were doing so well because they were taking it. And so helping somebody work their way around whatever the reasons are, the stigma that they feel when they're on it, um, the side effects maybe, or that sense of you know, just having to be you know, controlled by remembering to take their meds three times a day. So, so that kind of um, information is helpful for us. When we do this information, and you can literally just draw it on a piece of paper, make three columns, and get a sense of where the family's at, we can then find out when we call back the reporter, when we call other collateral contacts over the course of that 10 days, you know, what are their worries? Are they the same? What do they think is working well? You know, Hotline can be asking those questions of the reporter. Is there any family members that you know are you know, positive influence, that, that live nearby, et cetera, et cetera. That gives you information when you go out to the home. So the sooner we get this information in the case, the more effective it's going to be for us and for the families to figure out what's the narrowing of our focus on why they're involved and what we need to see happen. You want those things to be in clear, concrete behavioral descriptions. This is the map that um, they used in um, New Zealand. And that's that safety and context scale. That's what I want to draw your attention to right here. That's when 0 to 10, we're getting a number, and you're writing a number in. What is the agency's perspective? What is the family's? And what's the, the reporter or the collateral's numbers? And that gives us a sense of right when we get involved with this family, where are we at? How worried are we? so that we know as we go forward, are we able to check in and see is there progress towards the goal of increasing and enhancing safety. 
They also make out two different agency versus family goal sections where you're really able to acknowledge our goal might be different than the family's goal. But as we go through mapping um, with families at the table, we're getting better at getting everybody closer to a shared statement. And I want to be able to get to an example so that I can show you guys that. And you can think about how it applies to your own cases. So it's really integrating our, our whole approach. And I'm going to do a little drawing because for lack of a better <laughs> way to show it. If you think about having a fence to keep your livestock, in your, your prized livestock, in your, in your pasture, right? You need to have a fence. And if you have a fence, that has just posts, what's going to happen to the livestock if you just have posts? They're going to escape. They're going to come right through there, right? So the SDM tools are the posts in our practice, right? So you've got your safety and danger assessment. You've got your risk assessment. You've got your strengths and needs assessment. You've got your risk reassess, right? All those tools. And I know different counties do different ones, but you get the point right? Points in time throughout our practice. Try to envision signs of safety practice as the rails that are between the posts, right? This is the ongoing work that we do over the course of time, no matter how much time or how little time is involved, right? That allows us to think about what's our philosophy and approach to this work. And what are the actual things where we're doing safety mapping? We want to get the kids voice in, so we do the three houses. We want to make sure they build a network, so we do that activity. And we need to have a safety plan that allows this family to safely um, enact that plan long after we're gone. So that's the way in which we try to envision this integration. You can't put the same weight on SDM as you do on SOS. It's not 50-50 because it's only point in time, right? And a lot of these are just in the first 10 to 45 days. So you want to think about this as kind of over the long haul. And each of us naturally, because we're human beings, come to the work with a very different perspective. So I want you to envision the pendulum of child welfare practice. And you're, you're going to know exactly what I mean when I, when I draw this, right? So this is your pendulum. And the pendulum swings back and forth between two extremes. In its extreme, way over here, we have the child rescue mentality and approach to the work, right? We have to rescue those poor children from those bad, evil parents because they're evil and they hurt those kids and kids need to be pulled from that situation. In its extreme, that's what child rescue looks like. On the opposite side, we have family preservation. And family preservation, in its extreme, is we'll keep that family together at all costs. And that's dangerous in its extreme because what can happen? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Don't want that. Also know the harm that can be caused if we pull a child that really doesn't need to be pulled from the family, the emotional harm, the trauma that can be caused, right? So all of us have to figure out where do we fall in this continuum personally. What's the philosophy of our supervisor and our unit as a whole? Where do we fall in that continuum? How about the management of each office? And then systemically, what happens when there's a high profile case and the media gets their hands on it? Where does the pendulum swing? Way out here, right? And when that happens, what does Hotline do with the screening of cases? Screen everything in just in case, right? So the front door is wide open. And what happens to our back door during that time of a high profile case for ongoing workers who are doing? Dismiss. What's that? You don't dismiss. No. Don't close a case just in case. Don't return these kids home just in case. We have this weird psychological panic, right? So the back door gets locked. Bless you. And what happens to caseloads? They explode. Caseloads explode in a very, very short period of time. This can be two to three weeks, right? And all of a sudden, we are bulked out, and we're way beyond capacity. Workload 
when we have cases where there's legal involvement and there's placement, what does that mean for the workload of the average worker? Super high. Intact family, lower workload. The best permanency work that we do as an agency is every time we can keep a family together safely, right? And so how do we get out of this? How long do you think it takes to get this two to three week explosion under control? Keep going. Keep going. It takes 18 months to two years to get the caseload back down. And so we have to figure out a way how in the midst of crisis, the high profile case, the media involvement, right, all that stuff, that we stay focused right here on a balanced assessment of every case. Because if we don't, we end up with this cycle of disaster where we bulk the caseloads out for the agency and then it takes us two years to get them under control. So this allows us, this practice, to really pay attention, right? Decision making points along the way. What's our philosophy and approach and what are the skills that we can employ to really try to collect that balanced information? Does that make sense to folks? Okay, ask me questions if you feel like it's cloudy. Um, so being able to think about how do we integrate this is important, right? So safety threats on the checklist of an SDM tool reminds us of the specific behaviors that were dangerous, right? Did we miss any in our, in our documentation? It's just a quick check against each other. Protective capacities really help us think about the actual strengths that are safety. What are the acts of protection demonstrated over time, right? Any of the risk items, in the family strengths needs assessment, C and D items give us complicating factors, right? Any risk items not marked is a strength, right? That they're not exhibiting these issues. So that allows us to think about what needs to happen. That's the safety plan for the immediate safety and then the case plan over the long haul. We wanna just make sure we've addressed all these things and we didn't leave anything to chance. I have a question. Yep. Going back Yep. Um, not necessarily with a high profile case, but just an agency as a whole, how there is the extreme. Yes. How would the agency work at bringing kind of the focus of the workers and the supervisors more to the center? What have you seen? Yes. That effectively work? One or? of the things that seems to be contributing most is this notion of group supervision. Right, so do you guys have unit meetings when you get together with your supervisor and you hear what the updates are, they disseminate new information? Thinking about how we think our way through cases together is helping us get closer to a balanced assessment and being able to think about how we get legal and clinical on the same board. Getting the county council on board with this, helping the courts and the probation departments understand the approach we're taking as well. So there's been some trainings that have taken place in California that have brought folks together and what we're hearing is that judges and attorneys prefer the signs of safety approach and the way we document it because it's how they build a case legally. It has the nexus between the parent's behavior and the impact on the child as the primary focus. And it's allowing us to write much, much shorter court reports. How long is the average court report here in Butte County? Depends on which report you're talking about. Right, okay, so give me the average or, or what the options are. Well, the intense report could be seven pages to 15 pages. Yep. And the contested jurors could be up to 25 pages. Right. And the jurors could be, I don't know, yeah, average is 15 pages. Right. In Massachusetts, it's two to three pages for any of it. Yeah. So California wants to figure out how to get there, right? So what if you only had to state the very basic facts in a way that is sufficient and that legal is able to look at it and say, we're not gonna get sucked into all the biopsychosocial details. It's just around the family's behaviors and how they contribute to safety or danger and what is the plan that's going to be enacted and who's going to do it, what's the accountability piece. Can you imagine how your life might be different if that were the case? Wouldn't you feel like you'd have time to actually meet with families? Well, um, it would have to be systemic, I mean, you have to, uh... See that yeah, CMS would have to change. That's right. Right. And uh, what's what's happening is I think there's a lot of people buying into it and wanting to do this, um, but the timelines um, don't match. Don't match. Yes. And uh, the overall vision of the agency doesn't match. Yeah. Or whatever. If if we as a 
whole and the agency had a vision, we would we would have a pre we, uh, and the and the state would buy into it and uh, whatever mm -hmm. we would have a pre detention uh, yes. staffing. Yes. You know so that yes uh, that would be the focus rather than. After the fact, when a child is detained, like if we have all these detentions this weekend, there's absolutely no way That's right. that we're going to be able to use this process except for maybe one or two cases that I've been thinking about. Okay. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not just the social worker buying into it. It's systemically. It's the system mm -hmm. thinking it's, that's the movement we want to go into and making right. it, making it uh, um, a norm. The norm right. that we, right. it's okay to think like this because right. nobody wants to take the risk. Right. So you're talking we have about to take the risk. top down meets um, take bottom the up. Because, right. Top down needs to take the fucking risk. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're tired of taking the risk yep. every single day. That's right. And we're, we'll gladly take the easy way out because that minimizes the risk. Yep. But we can't have the top or the state or the lawyers blaming us. That's right, if Every something day. goes wrong. Whose responsibility is it to keep kids and families safe? No, it's the parents. And they've led us to believe that they believe it's us. The, pop, the popular belief in the community is that it's us. And the newspaper reflects that it's us. But we know it's the family's responsibility. And until we start to see a sea change and that big shift, we, the best we can do is control our individual practices with kids and families that are on our caseload, right? And then over time, as the system is catching up, we're able to prove that this actually keeps kids safer than expecting us to do it. We don't live with families. We don't want to live with families. We're not going to live with families. We have to figure out how to do that. So if I can kind of parking lot your conversation about the systemic piece, I'll come back to it. Um, but what I want to do in looking at our time is really move to some specific examples that are going to give you a chance to see what the impact is on the family and how it enhances safety. And when we can prove to the attorneys in the court and the higher ups that this actually does enhance safety better, more effectively, we're going to start to see the system change. And you're absolutely right. It feels like right now workers are doing this in a context that feels like it's an add on to their work, not a replacement of other things that didn't feel effective with things that are more effective. And so that's something that each county has to figure their way through. Um, but in the meantime, the folks who are doing it are really able to see um, some immediate impact, especially at, in ER cases, right, or IR cases. And I know you guys aren't using differential response by now, right now, but I just came from Lake County, and they're talking about completely revising their forms and that their investigators were in, they're on the committee in the conversation making the changes that they see is going to be helpful to be able to switch what used to be a risk reduction plan or a safety plan form to be more family friendly language and then cuts right to the chase and it kind of minimizes some of the amount of things that they have to document. So um, these are some solution focused questions that you have to elicit the danger and the safety from families and I'm going to skip over that so that we can move on and I can actually talk to you about creating a danger statement because I think that's the key thing. When a family has the same perspective about why they're involved as we do, if you can even just get to that in one of your cases, you're going to see forward motion for that family in a different way. So when we look at Cheryl, we're clear what was danger versus a complicating factor. This also takes practice as an agency to get on the same page. The worker, the supervisor, and the manager may have a difference of opinion about what represents danger versus a complicating factor. Either way, we don't want complicating factors um, to be minimized, right? So we're acknowledging that sometimes this contributes to risk. We're worried that these could go to that place that could, you know, end up with a kid hurt. Um, but to be clear about why we're involved with Cheryl, she turned on the gas while her kids were at home. Danger, bad, opposite of good. Complicating factors, depression, poverty, domestic violence, and currently unemployed. She does not have to resolve all of these things in order for her kids to come home if she has a plan that's absolutely going to keep them safe from this danger happening again. Does that make sense? But yet, we focus a lot of our attention on these other factors, even when we can't directly connect the impact on the kids. 
And that's because we've got to learn to sit with the risk, and that's to your point. Looking at the safety, does she have anything in the safety box? No. You could put that she had the past um, safety, you know, where for X number of years her kids were medically um, to, up to date, attending school and all of those things, and that might help build rapport with her, but at the end of the day, it didn't protect the kids from this. Could you put that she opened the window and maybe that saved their life? Yeah, you could. Is it enough to return the kids home tomorrow? No. We need to see her figure out a way to safely parent her children even when she's feeling depressed, right? Even when she's not at 100%, we need her to be able to demonstrate that her kids are going to be safe in her care. So putting the kids in the next room is probably one of the only things that maybe you could consider um, moving up there. And this is how it looks in the, the other map. It's the same thing, only I think families see this as more simplistic and are less overwhelmed than by seeing the grid with some of those jargony kind of words, right? So when we're talking about danger, notice it doesn't say Cheryl attempted suicide. That's clinical words. Those are professional words used by professionals and we write things for other professionals. Signs of Safety asks us to rethink that and to actually write in language that a seven-year-old child can understand if they read it. So if a seven-year-old can understand it, we know it's less confusing for the parents, and the court, of course, is going to understand it. So turning the gas on with the children at home, that's the behavior that she did. We didn't say the word suicide attempt, right? Having physical altercations with a boyfriend that led the child to want to intervene, we didn't say domestic violence. See the difference? So we can lose the jargon with families and in our reporting and documentation of what happens and get right to the behaviors so that the families are getting more and more clear about why we're involved sooner on in the process and not feeling potentially confused but afraid to ask us for clarification. So once we get the mapping where we're clear internally and with the family about why we're involved versus why we wouldn't be involved, then we can get a harm and danger statement that allows us to have kind of that concise overview and then think about the goals. We can't get to how we're going to get to those goals until we get a network of people. We need to decrease the isolation in families and we can use our authority, our skillful use of authority to say the department is not going to be comfortable moving forward until you get your support people to the table, right? So I want you to each think right now about who do you call when you're stressed out? Let's say you have a problem. Who's the first person you call? Chelsea, who do you call? My sister. Who do you call? My dad. Who do you call? My best friend. Who do you call? My sister. Who do you call? My therapist. <laughs> Can I get a high five? Okay, that was awesome. Awesome. Okay, so none of you, except you, you ruined it, said, I call the local MSW. Right? You call your people, which in many occasions can include a professional, but our first resort is usually a friend, a spouse, a partner, a sibling, a relative, right? So how do we help families respect and recognize they're not calling those people anymore or the people that they are calling are not helpful in their lives? They might be toxic. They might be pulling them away from the, the good choices that they want to make and that we can actually sit down with those folks and say, are you willing to hear why the department is worried for this family, for the family to share why we're all worried, and for them to make a decision at that moment? Are we going to be here for the best interest of these kids, or can we just, we, we're too busy, our own lives are too chaotic, we, we, we're too hectic, we can't help? When given the opportunity to make the life of a child better, most people will rise to the occasion but we don't want to set them up for failure either. We want to make sure that the people were, that are coming and making a commitment are making a realistic commitment. So the facilitated process that allows that to take place gives us a chance to really sift out who's going to be here for this kid, even if we don't pay them to be for this, here for this kid. Who's going to stay with this family and support this mom long after we want to close the case, right? So that we can see a plan, get created by that group, have it put in place, test it, monitor it, give it, give it an opportunity over time to be demonstrated, tweak it along the way. And then maybe it's four months out, maybe it's six months out, maybe it's a year out, we're ready to close a case because it's airtight and they're doing it and we're not worried anymore. Our worry meter went down. 
and look, our SDM risk reassess says they went from high to moderate, right? So that's the moment when we feel much more comfortable closing a case. Otherwise, what happens when you close a case when it's just mom and the kids again, and this is their fourth time being involved with us? We think she's got it together, right? Fingers crossed. We're a little anxious about it, right? We're like, oh God, please let this be the time when they finally figure it out. What I've said to families who've had multiple involvements with us, don't you want it to be different this time? Doesn't it feel like something should be different? I want it to be different. You want it to be different. We're gonna take you through a process that's hopefully gonna feel different. We want it to feel respectful. We want it to feel engaging. We want them to take the onus to keep their kids safe and not depend on us to do it. So this gives us a chance to think about it. I'm gonna skip the data stuff, but what we're finding is that there are far few detain fewer detainments in states where they're doing this practice. Caseloads are going down. What are the caseloads right now here in Butte County? 20? 20, 25. 25. Wow. Okay, take a deep breath, ready? Inhale, exhale. They're down to 15 in Massachusetts, on average. Some have eight to 10 in their offices. The highest right now is like 23 max. I just wanted to comment on what you said about families that have been in the process. Yep. I've been facilitating some safety mappings and there's been three distinctive times that a family, it's been a repeat families and they have said, this is really different, yeah. those actual words. So you're so hearing just, that feedback yeah. already. And that's really powerful. We have, um, and what we ask is that you think about your worst case. You want to apply this. This is designed for the highest risk cases and your stuckest cases not the easy peasy ones. This is the one that you're like, wow, I don't know that we're ever gonna get this family out of our system. So that's where you wanna start with this. So the data is telling us that um, recidivism rate, 2%, right? That's a lot lower than our current recidivism rates as a, as a county and as a nation. If we do this effectively, now like all practices, we're rigorous or we're not, and there's gonna, it's gonna matter, right? So you gotta get really rigorous with this. It is a front-loaded type of practice. It requires a lot of energy in the initial contact with the families that slowly over time gets less and less. It might mean we think about staffing differently. It might mean we think about systemically, right, changing systems, but the folks who have done it, in 2007, they only terminated rights of four families in the entire year in their county. Can you imagine? What is the difference? Holy cow, what, it's like that sense of are we missing the boat? What is it that we haven't been doing? So it really does allow placements to decrease, court use to decrease, and the time that you have then is really spent doing the practice instead of just all the steps it takes to go through the legal process. Foster care reviews, all the driving the kids around. I mean, once you get four kids in a family in four different placements, your workload goes through the roof, right? So um, screening rates have started to trend down in Massachusetts, and I think that's because we have one of the higher thresholds. Our statutory language has us automatically screening in more than some other states, and so we're starting to recognize that might be doing more harm for families. When you acknowledge that it's traumatic for a child protection intervention to happen at all, knock, 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 right, a worker's at my door, we gotta make sure that that's absolutely necessary if we're going to be doing it. And I think in some cases it was the, nobody wants to sit with the risk, err on the side of caution. We didn't take the three days to collect the additional information to make an appropriate assessment. We just said, we'll get out there, we'll get someone out there, and then they can do the work. And unfortunately, that's got a negative impact on families in many cases where it wasn't warranted. So being able to um, see already that our placements are trending down, recidivism, they're just looking at the numbers now, so when I get back, hopefully I'll get more information. It's not like they're laying off staff because oh, no, they're, no, no, no. they're moving them from the back end to the front end where they're working more intensively exactly. with families and they're taking the time to really go through this process. And so they're trying to do no more than two workers per case, you know, so that you've got, if it comes in for an investigation, we do have differential response. Um, that, that they're gonna have the investigator do the investigation and then it moves to the ongoing worker for the rest of the case, life of the case. And for those doing the differential response, that worker gets that and keeps it for the life of the case. So it could be one, maybe two workers per family. And that's what families came to the table and said, if there's any way I can tell my story less often, that would be great. 
um, so that they've been trying to do that. And that's allowing for continuity of flow of information because how much do you have in your head that you're not, it's not humanly possible to get it all in the system, you know, documented. So that helps as well. Um, so I'm going to back out of this presentation and pull up the one on danger statements to kind of take you to the next step um, that allows you to think about how do we take the information we organize and actually get it to a succinct place where the family can share it with their network of people. So this is the one that's on creating danger statements. It's the blue handout that you have. So the three takeaways here, appreciation of the importance of having shared understanding and shared agreement about why we're involved. Getting on the same page about what we're worried about and what's working well is the phrase I use when I talk with a family. We want to get on the same page. When I ask you all about agreeing to something, we make an assumption when you nod your head yes that your head bobbing is the same thing as his head bobbing, that you all mean the same thing. Is that actually true in reality? Not necessarily, right? So we use this approach called the gradients of agreement. And it's a great thing to use with families. Because when you're doing a service plan or case plan with families, and you think they're in agreement with that, implementing that safety plan or that case plan task, we may or may not be mistaken. So this looks at this on a continuum. I'm telling you, the scaling thing is the best thing since sliced bread. So figuring out how far are they from endorsing or vetoing the idea, right? So you can be on a scale of one, two, three, four, or five. One is, I love it. It was probably my idea if I'm a one. I'm all about it. I think it's fabulous. A two is, I like it. I might have a reservation, might tweak one or two things, but in general, I like it. Three is to kind of um, stand aside, abstain. Um, how many of you don't consider yourselves process people? And when people process stuff to death, it drives you insane? Anyone, anyone, right? So oftentimes your three is just make the decision already, OK? I'm tired of going round and round about this. Four is, you know what, I'm actually not comfortable. And I really don't like the idea, but I won't stand in the way. And that's really key, right? And that's of the plan. And five is no way, no how. Not only am I not comfortable, not doing it. Nothing you can say is going to make me do it. And I might go out to the water cooler and tell other people about not doing it as well. Right? So that's that kind of undercurrent that's going to undermine the process because someone is so passionately against the plan that was proposed. Right? Why are people fours and fives not just to be a pain in the ass? They have reasons for why they disagree with the decision. They're troubleshooting. They're thinking ahead. And they've got, from their own lens and their own perspective, worried that the plan is missing something. So how do we engage people that might disagree with what we thought was a one or a two and figure out what would it take from their perspective to move it from a four to a three, move it from a three to a two? And that allows us to get closer. If you are the manager, if you are the manager, right? <laughs> You get information by checking in with the group to say, where is everybody? And over time, you create a safe environment where people get comfortable saying, if they're a four, if they are, or a five. But generally speaking, if they vote first on a plan that's proposed, whether it's yours or it comes from higher up or you know, the ground up, and the whole room is twos, threes, and ones, what's your impression as a manager of that? Cool. Right? it's actually probably going to get implemented. The likelihood of success is high. If you're a one and all your staff are fours and fives, what information does that provide for you? It's going to be really tough. Yeah. <laughs> we might want to have a do-over. Yeah. Just saying, we might want to go back to the drawing board and get a sense of how we can do this differently so that everybody's going to move themselves to a three, two, or a one. Make sense? You can see the advantage of it internally. Imagine doing it with a family where you're able to say, OK, these are the three steps I need you to take in the safety plan so I can keep your kids home safe with a plan, right? And they're telling you their fours and fives on their ability to do it. What information does that provide you as a social worker? It's not going to work. No can do. 
right? So you can assess willingness, confidence, and capability of families. Willingness to do it, if willingness is high, right, that's like insight, okay, we like that. If confidence is low, but willingness is high, what does that tell us? Willingness is high, confidence is low. They might need the tools, they might need some education on how to do it, they might need support to do it, right? They don't believe in themselves, they might need some self-esteem encouragement, that kind of stuff, right? If their capacity rating is middle of the road or high, we feel much better about that than if they rate it low, right? If someone who knows them, like their therapist, their school guidance counselor, or their doctor says, I believe this mom's capacity is high. If her sister tells us she thinks it's high, we feel all the more validated that it's gonna work, right? So the more people we can get to assess the parent's willingness, capacity, and confidence, the better. So this is gradients of agreement. And it recognizes that we absolutely don't all mean the same thing every time we agree, right? That there's a continuum of agreement about what families are gonna do and their ability to do it. So having a danger statement allows us to actually get on closer to the same number on why they're involved in the first place. Understanding the collaborative process of creating harm and danger statements with families is the other key piece. And then that goes for their safety goals as well. What do they have to do to get the kid home or to close the case? That's the safety goal. How they do it is the plan. So the what is the goal, the how is the plan. And templates for these statements are included in this presentation. Okay, I just totally got mindful that I said I would give you a quick stretch break. We have like, we have like 20 minutes left. So let me check in. Do you guys wanna take a couple minutes and stretch and move around and, or do you wanna just plow through this and get done at 11? Anybody not in favor of plowing through? Okay, <laughs> exactly. Because I know your body needs a natural break, especially if you drink coffee or tea or whatever in the morning, right? So I just forgive me for kind of, I know this is a lot of information. It's like a full day of training in two hours. And I wanted you to have the information to take away. Um, and I also want you to know what other pieces are gonna be offered over the two days that I'm here. And if you're interested in coming to hear more about it, um, that that's possible as well. Um, but what this content is about is the collaboration factor with everybody who's a stakeholder in this family's life really is what makes this most successful. So doing it in isolation is one piece. Having everybody there at the table can really take it to the next level. And that question, what is the caregiver's impact on the child, always helps us determine what information goes north in the top box versus what goes south. If there's no impact, it's gonna be a complicating factor or a supporting strength. If there is impact, positive or negative, it's gonna be in the safety box or in the danger and harm box, right? Is everybody clear about that? That's how you work your way through it. If you don't actually, if you don't actually have the same perspective as your supervisor, or your manager, so all three of you could see things differently. This is a great way to check our thinking. What specifically is the impact that we see on the kid? Or how could we find out the actual impact? A lot of times we don't have that information yet. And who could we ask can really help us figure our way out. So worker and supervisor have gone out to the home and met the family, or maybe worker's gone to the home and met the family, supervisor's met them in the office. Manager's only met them through what she reads in the system. Right, so that lens is three removed and is looking very differently at the information that's, that's collected, right? So helping to be as clear as we possibly can in our documentation gets us closer together with our thinking with management as well. If you're stating in every situation, this was the behavior, this is the impact it had on the kids, and this is our worry and level of worry, if those four things are in there, your manager is gonna be more clear about what your experience was like with the family. That allows us to then get closer to, okay, now what are the steps we need to happen? Sometimes we do the steps that need to happen before we have shared agreement and shared understanding about the information we've collected. This allows us to do what I call slowing down to go fast. If we slow down and organize this information and everybody gets on the same page, 
we can fly through the, the solution piece a lot more quickly. It's when we didn't take the time to do that and people are still stuck in trying to figure out now what exactly is the impact, that creates the slowdown factor that puts the brakes on our work just when we think we're trying to speed up to the next phase. So you're able to get the safety statement as a concise, short, short, short paragraph of what safety, what acts of protection have been demonstrated in the past, right? Because remember when we looked at Cheryl with the yellow and the red? We wanted to see that both of those were equal. When we do the three column list, we want them to be equal. We want to assess as much of the safety as possible so that we have an equal value and understanding of that. That's a safety statement. The harm and danger statement is what happened that was bad in the past and how it hurt the kids, as well as our future worries based on what happened in the past or what could happen, right? So have you ever had that case where risk was so high, right, that we intervened to prevent the kids from being hurt? Usually we don't detain kids based on risk. Sometimes we do, but it has to be really, really, really high, and it has to be justifiably high in order for us to do that. So I think about the analogy of the game Jenga. If you ever played the game Jenga, it's the three little um, pieces of wood lined up and opposing, and each time it's your turn, you have to pull one out. And as you go around, the, the tower gets more and more unstable. And let's imagine that this is the moment where you pull it out and you just know it's coming down. If that thing comes out, the whole thing's going to topple and you're going to lose the game. If one factor in this family, as it's teetering on its edge, changes, grandma, for example, moves away, and she's the one person that keeps this family barely afloat, right, the whole thing's going to go, we might need to intervene at that moment. So it's helping us think about when there's really high risk cases where there's nothing in the harm box but the danger is based on complicating factors, how do we write that in a way that's gonna make sense? And then the safety goal statement is about the what needs to happen. And it's our perspective of what needs to happen and the families. They may be the same or they may be two different sentences, right, that describe that. And then we can move to the, the how, which is the plan. So each of the harm and danger statements has three components. Harmful caregiver actions, impact on the child, and then the danger part is the future concern. So we can break them out into a harm statement and a danger statement to ease the confusion. Who reported, disclosed, shared what that was harmful? What happened and what was the impact on the child? Sometimes we are worried as a department about something, but the family's not worried. Or maybe their extended family members, kinship care providers, the grandparents, whomever are worried, but the actual biological caregivers who are named on this report are not worried. So we want to be clear about who's worried versus who isn't. So for Cheryl, her harm statement is Cheryl turned on the gas of her home stove, locked herself in the kitchen, which exposed both the kitchen and the rest of the apartment to high levels of toxic fumes. Both of her children were home at the time, were exposed to the high levels of fumes, and lost consciousness as a result. It doesn't say Cheryl attempted suicide while her kids were at home. Do you see the difference? Are you, are you confused about what happened here at all? Or is it clear? It's crystal clear, isn't it? Is a judge going to be confused about that? How about opposing counsel, mom's lawyer? Is mom's lawyer going to get why we're worried? Are they going to be able to lambaste you on the stand when you testify about that? No, because the bottom line is we were crystal clear in not writing words that led to open speculation and interpretation, right? And so what we do is we avoid the generalities of the jargon. Mother tried to kill herself, mother was suicidal, mother tried to kill her kids, mother has mental illness. See the difference in how it's documented? This kind of documentation cuts down to the behavior and, and protects us as a system from outside forces trying to argue the opposite, for starters. It also makes Cheryl crystal clear about what behaviors led to a child protection level of intervention. Danger statements, as I said, who's worried about what potential actions by the caregiver and the potential impact that that could have on the, on the kids. So staying detailed with those behavioral descriptions is really key as we talk about our worries. CPS and the doctors in the hospital are worried that Cheryl may try to injure herself again in the future and that the children could become injured or hurt as a result. Make sense? 
So being able to share those statements with the caregiver if they didn't co-create them with you, with the extended network and appropriate providers, allows us to have that power and being absolutely clear in our concerns, makes clear what we're really looking for the parents to step up to. What do they need them to do, what do we need them to do? And shares focus for all involved and avoids what I call casework drift. Have you had that experience where you're drifting into all this other stuff that isn't your job description, right? Because you're that one voice, that one ear, the family has gotten to know you and they like you and you're willing to do stuff because you have access to resources and you know, let's say they want new housing now and they know that you've got some access to housing. But you're not worried about their current house. That's not why they're involved. That's lovely they want to move and get a new place, but does, how does that become your job when all of a sudden you're doing housing searches and you know, getting them connected to other agencies and referrals and taking them out to see other places? Like, wait a minute, what just happened, right? So all of a sudden we get sucked into this other place. This allows us to avoid that more often because we're setting clear limits and boundaries about what is our role versus what it isn't. Make sense? Questions about that? So this is Kim and Paul. And Kim and Paul have um, an open case in Boston. Kim is a single mom, and she has Paul, who's 10. And she passed out while shooting heroin and cooking dinner while Paul was at home. And so we filed what we call a care and protection, same as a detainment. And Paul is living with his Aunt Donna and her wife, Anne. So they're pro uh, kinship providers for Paul right now. And um, we went through the mapping session with this family at the table. So what are we worried about? Kim overdosed on heroin and became unconscious while cooking dinner. Ten-year-old Paul was at home at the time. Her landlady heard the fire alarm and had to call the police and break in the door. Kim has an extensive history of heroin use in the past and reports that she's been struggling with addiction for more than 15 years. Led to one DCF referral four years ago when Paul came to school multiple days smelling of urine and feces. So that's pretty clear that that rises to the level of danger. Because what are the factors? Remember there had to be a couple of components in there? What are the factors that we have in here that make it rise to a child protection intervention in an actual harm and danger statement? The mom being unconscious. Yep. And? Long history of substance use. And? And? It left Paul with no care. Exactly. And the impact on Paul. Exactly. So you listed all the major things we're worried about. Because they impacted Paul, they're involved and it's considered harmful and dangerous from a child protection perspective. Kim attributes her current incident where this happened to a growing depression after losing her job as a saleswoman at a department store. And she's been looking for work for more than 14 weeks and can't find anything. And her sister and her sister's wife confirmed this, that she's pounding the pavement and she can't find a job. She had stopped attending NA two plus years ago. And the worker used the quotes of the mom in this case, which is very helpful technique to get the parents' exact words up there. Why aren't you going to NA? Why did you quit? They get kind of preachy and the meetings were not good times. So that was mom's perspective on why NA was no longer useful for her. Kim has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and ADD. Is that danger or a complicating factor? Yep, it's a complicating factor, right? Mom's borderline's not going away, but we know she can be a good parent under different circumstances, right? Kim stated, I'm doing what I need to do, and I don't know why my son has not been able to come back to me yet. That's a major worry that she has. We documented it. I'm worried about my son growing up without his mom, and I want him back, right? Kim appreciates her sister's help, but Donna can be a know-it-all, and it's hard to work with her sometimes to care for her son. So by documenting the parents' worries that might have seemed otherwise something that we wouldn't necessarily write down, what does that do for this mom when she sees her words written down? Validated. Totally validated. Well, maybe they do hear me. Maybe they are going to pay attention to what I do well, right? So three components in the harm and danger statement. What happened in the past? How did it impact the kids? What are we worried about that's going to happen in the future? Just another quick example. DCF, the doctor at the hospital, and Adam's mom, Tanya, are worried that Adam's dad, Matt, will hit Adam like he did last week and leave him with bruises or even more serious injuries. Are we clear there, clear there about what happened? 
who's worried, and the impact on the kid. Right? So I color-coded it so you could see that all three colors are in both, right? The, the criteria that should be in each statement and each component represented in that statement. What do we know about Kim that's going well? This is the yellow side of the assessment, right, from that picture earlier. Kim has been clean and sober for four years before this incident. When you hear that there's a four-year stretch of clean and sober, what does that tell you? Right? She's doing something right. She has a past history of protection, right? Because what do we know? During that time, Paul came to school clean, on time, and with his work done. You have to make the link. How many parents do you have that clean and sober still can't parent their kids effectively, right? We always want to be clear about which case is this. And in this case, we know Kim does a really good job when she can stay clean and sober. It's a different kind of write-up, right, in a conversation. If not only do we need her clean, we got to think about all the ways in which her parenting needs to improve um, even when she is clean and sober. In her past work with the department, she worked with her worker, a home-based outreach team, went into drug treatment, and ensured that Paul came to school and was appropriately clothed and bathed, right? So when she's working with us, Paul's in better shape. Paul was able to go into kinship placement with his aunt, able to stay in the same school system, and he's thriving there despite the changes. And Kim had made a plan with Donna before we even got involved. If anything were to ever happen to me, I want Paul to stay with you. So that's also a strength, right? Because we know that their relationship is in, in a good enough place where hopefully there's not going to be so much friction that we're going to have a disruption here while he's in placement. Kim has a ton of past history of drug treatment. Five times she's been in detox, twice in inpatient substance abuse treatment, and she completed an inpatient stay after this incident, and now she's going back to NA meetings. She has a relapse plan, and she's able to talk openly about it. We like that. We're a big fan of folks being in treatment and having a plan. I'm only a big fan of it if it directly relates to Paul, right? So I want to find out more about how that involves Paul. Because what's up with Paul not calling himself when the kitchen's on fire because mom's shooting heroin and passes out while cooking dinner? He's 10. Like, that for as a social worker, I'm, I want to know more about that. What's Paul's capacity to keep himself safe, and how can we build on the safety plan to include and involve Paul? Kim um, is getting help from Donna and Ann financially, which is helpful because she's unemployed. Kim's in individual treatment, and she's attending regularly, and she's taking her meds, Ritalin and Celexa, regularly. Kimberly says, I want Paul back, and we'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. I'm also a fan when a parent articulates they want their child back, right, versus the ones who don't. I love my mom, and I want to be back with her. Helpful to get Paul's perspective on this whole thing, right? And the three houses interview is another way that we get the child's words back into the map. Kim's a great mom and has been doing really well, and I think she can be clean and sober again, says her sister and her sister's wife. Her sister knows her best, far better than we ever would. So if we trust her sister and her sister says that, I'm going to feel even better on how I scale this situation about the likelihood of her figuring this out. And the school hasn't seen any problems since Paul's been in the school, which is both while in her care and now the care of Donna and Ann. So see how we all of a sudden have a different perspective and an interest in, in how Kim's strengths and her needs uh, balance out? Creating a safety statement says what are the caregiver actions they've done to date and how did it mitigate the danger? How did it keep a kid safe? Back to Adam. His mom, Tanya, called mom, her mom for help. When Matt threatened to hit Adam last month and Matt went for a walk to cool down, Adam was protected from harm. So if part of mom's plan is to reach out to grandma and dad's at the table and says, okay, when you call grandma, that's a signal for me that I got to cool my jets and they can make it work, we feel better about that. It's concrete description of the behavior. This is a, quote, physical abuse case, but nowhere in there do we use the words physical abuse, right? Make sense? It is a shift in how we write things and how we document things, but we found it to be a really beneficial shift. And I know a lot of workers have said, I need my supervisor to like read my stuff and say back to me, hey, can you describe what you meant by this jargon word? And it helps us get more and more in the practice of writing things out. So when we think about goals, 
Phil Dector uses the phrase, how many have seen Phil Dector do training? Few folks. Dead man's goals, did you ever hear him talk about this? Right? Mr. Smith would have to be dead in order to achieve, give us 100% guarantee that he's going to achieve those goals, that Mr. Smith will not hurt Billy and no one in the family will hurt Billy. So we want to, instead of state what not to do, we want to create an action goal that states in a way that's framed what people are going to do. Mr. Smith will discipline Billy only in ways that won't hurt Billy, and we can ask the family what are ways in which you've disciplined that are different than this, that have been effective for you in the past, and figure out what those are. Family members will work together to keep Billy safe. So it's not just dad, it's the whole family taking action and onus about help Billy stay safe. So well-formed goals have to operationalize what it is we're looking to see and the impact it's going to have, right? Mom going to therapy may or may not be helpful unless her goals relate back to keeping her kids safe. Make sense? These are the things that we have to have in a goal statement. Oops, sorry. They have to directly relate to the danger statement. Be specific and describe what we're expecting the parents to do differently rather than what we're expecting to see stop. How many times do your plans say mother will refrain from abusing substances? Right? It's on a lot of our forms. I mean, it's like everywhere. How do we think about systemically switching that to say what they will do and recognize it's got to be uniquely crafted for each different family situation? Right? We're tailoring these to each family as we do them. Be collaboratively made, or if they can't be for some reason, include choices wherever possible. Right, so for Kim, she had NA treatment and therapy in the past to maintain being sober and clean. How do we say to her, if she's hung up on NA meetings, not being good times anymore, we don't care how you do it, you just got to pick something that's going to work, and we need to know that someone's going to report back to us that it's actually working. Not just that you attend, but that it's having a positive impact on your son, right? We don't have to get into the power struggle. Did Kim have UAs? Do you remember hearing that? No. There's no history of her doing a UA for us. Why? Yeah, drug testing, urinary, urinary analysis. Why didn't we do drug testing with Kim? Any ideas? She, she might have refused, right? She might not have been, that might not have been a way that helped her feel like she'd maintain her, her sobriety. Maybe she was someone who circumvented around it, used someone else's urine, blah, 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 found the workarounds. Whatever it is, if it's not effective for her, but the other stuff is, let's go with the other stuff. We're avoiding one more power struggle with a parent, and we're getting the outcome we want to see, right? So how do we figure out, get the family to articulate what works best for them, and how do we have them do more of it, instead of assuming all substance abuse cases have to have drug testing. See the difference? Because it might just be us spinning our wheels. Oh, and P.S., it's a lot of extra work for you. If it's not necessary, why do it? Make sense? So really getting concrete and specific um, in straightforward, measurable language, right, is key. Cheryl cannot be alone with her children if she is a danger to herself or others. Cheryl needs to show CPS that she's no longer a danger to herself or others. That's the goal. How she does that has to be spelled out, right? We got her to, to demonstrate somehow she's addressed the depression, that she can ask for help if needed, and that she can keep her child safe, her children safe, even when she's struggling. That's the key for us. We don't want the whole thing to unravel and there be no safety net. How is Cheryl going to keep her girl safe even when she's starting to feel more depressed, even when she's out of a job if she's Kim, right? Kim says losing that job was the big trigger that put her over the edge and she picked up heroin again. How do we help her figure out what to do? Because we thought, right, that when that case closed four years earlier, that she would take her son to Paul's if she was going to use heroin again. And instead, what did she do? Do you remember? She cooked dinner. Yeah, while shooting heroin for her son while he was home. <coughs> if she had taken her son to Donna's and said, can you keep him for the weekend, right? If she told Donna she was worried and going to pick up and use again, Donna could have intervened. But instead, she flew solo, it didn't work, and it had a negative impact on Paul. 
So this is a great template for, I love this template for safety goals. You can literally copy and paste this for every case and fill in the blanks. Mother will need to work with CPS and a safety network of family, friends, and professionals to develop a plan that will show everyone that, blah, 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 fill in the blank, right? She's gonna be able to, to parent her child even when she's feeling unstable. CPS will need to see the plan in place and working from a period of at least X number of months so that everyone is confident that the safety plan will keep working once CPS withdraws. That is really clear what our expectation is to the, fam to the family. Now, the network training is a whole different piece. How many people do you need to have in a network? What do you do when you get a network together? There's a whole other workshop on that that we're gonna get to, is it this afternoon? Yeah. So being able to think about, it means different things to different families. And that's about your level of worry and what specific on the ground things have to take place. It could just be one or two people and you're satisfied in one case, whereas you need 10 people <laughs> to manage this stuff in another case. So it just depends on that. So, you know, this is just an example with, with Matt and Adam being able to discipline Adam in ways that don't injure him and they give the specific examples. But it allows us to tailor this for each and every family that we serve and it describes it in a way that's going to be clear to them and to us why we're involved. So I'm aware of the time. We did not get to the three houses, but you do have an example of the three houses um, in your handout. And that's Ariana's case. It's the white one. And this is something that really helps staff get a much stronger perspective on what Ariana was exposed to versus what she wasn't relative to the domestic violence that took place in her home. And I just wanna quickly, if you guys are willing to indulge me for a couple of minutes, just draw your attention. Um, to the process of this. This family, um, I think this girl was in placement for over a year, just over a year when this was done. So this, I'm unfortunately sorry to say, wasn't one that was done during an emergency response. Um, but what it allowed us to do was get a sense of one, one thing um, that was most predominant is she's living in a fantasy world. Her coping skills has been to start to, to bring everything to a fantasy place where she is a superhero and she bangs her head on a rock and grows a cape and wings and she saves children and animals who are being hurt right so she's got all these themes playing out and then she'd come back to these lucid moments where I'd redirect her to talking about the real family the real people she lives with and if you look at her house of worries she drew daddy Stephen clown man and if you read below this is her mother's boyfriend, very large arms and hands and a scary mouth. Yet look at the front page with the stick figure people on the front, right? Those are the safe people, house of good things. That's her mom and her little brother and her foster sister she, she drew. But this guy, right, big scary guy. And she said very clearly, um, this is Daddy Steven and he looks like a freak. He also said his face is stupid and he said, shut up, I'm gonna hit you, Mim mimicking his loud, angry tone. She plainly stated he's evil. She said, Heather, he's like a maniac. She's six, he's evil. He bit mommy on the neck, stole my mommy's purse and pushed her down the stairs. I'll poke him in the eye and hope he dies. I threw him out the window and he married another woman. So she's got her way of coping with what she witnessed. And when I asked her how this made her feel, she stated she didn't wanna talk about it anymore and she went right back into her fantasy play about how she's a superhero and she hides her wings so that no one can see them. So this was very telling for the social worker. It gave us a lot of information about where this kid's at and the point at which she's at around her willingness to be with him. When you look at the house of hopes and dreams, the questioning is very specific in this activity to give us information about if all her worries, ding, 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 Daddy Steven, were no longer in the picture and were resolved, what would it look like? How would people be together in the home? Who would be together in the home? And she drew her foster mom, not her bio mom. She drew foster sister and friends. She drew a cat that the father had killed or the stepfather had killed in the home um, before. And she stated that um, if Daddy Steven is not there, her worries would go away. She also said Tammy, her bio mom, lives in the room downstairs in her house of dreams. 
See, she wants to be with bio mom, but she just wants it to be safe. So she's, she knows that she feels sad that she doesn't live with Tammy or the baby. That's her new baby brother. She stated that she has two families and she lives with her foster family right now, but she doesn't know if they're relatives. She likes Tammy's house, but no bad stuff happens at Anne Marie's house. That's the foster mom. And she said, Thank, thanked me for making her draw those pictures. So it really was telling for the worker that they have to demonstrate that Tammy can really keep her safe. And she has to believe that Tammy can keep her safe in order for her to be reunited with her. She got more out of this interview than she's had out of this kid in the amount of time she's had the case. There's something about drawing that engages kids in giving us different information and more information than we might otherwise have received. So I wish I could kind of give you more time on the technique and all of that, but we are out of time. Um, questions so far, I know it's a lot of information, but if you think about the life of a case, whether it's 10 days or the whole time they're involved with us, by doing some of these practices, some of these steps over time, can you see the benefit it would have for families? Questions about it? Worries about your role? Yeah. Um, with the greenhouses, because um, I've used this before with another county, and I'm wanting to use it here as well, um, there were some questions about, and I never quite got a clear answer from Dr. Turnell um, about when you do the three houses with children, my take on it was to do the three houses and then ask their permission to show the parents, yep. you know, so you get sort of a clear picture from them and they're not worried about what the other people in their lives would think. Exactly. Um, and I had a couple of different situations where that the children were just drawn, 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 and then can I show your parents? Oh, no. Great. Oh, no. No, 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 no. no. So in the, yeah. yes, in the practice, you always explain to the child what they're going to be doing, what it's going to be used for, that we are going to share it with all of the grown-ups from the beginning. That way they know right away. So it says right in here, the very first paragraph, Three Houses activity was explained and she agreed to draw the pictures and it would be okay for the social worker to share them in her words captured by the social worker to all of the grown-ups involved. Really, really key. So some kids will draw, others will write, some will draw and you'll write, but you want to be really transparent about that this is going to be shown to the grown-ups and it's about their voice being valued in the process and sometimes moms and dads forget how smart kids are and how much they know and have seen. And so for Ariana, it was about making sure that her mom and everybody knew what her thoughts and feelings were about what she was worried about, what was working well, and what would need to change. And so this information then went back and was shared with the parents. There will be some kids, depending on their age and stage, that are not going to be comfortable, are going to ask you to not share, just like they do now in an interview. Well, if I tell you this, you can't tell anybody, right? And how do we respond to that? What do we have to say when kids try to give us that ultimatum? That's right. There are three exceptions to that rule, right? And then we can go into our spiel about that. It's the same thing with this. Some folks have expressed a worry about, you know, in a forensic interview, what if they disclose sexual abuse, right? And how do we handle sexual abuse disclosures in general? It's no different here than it would be in our regular walk. It's just a different approach to the same practice in trying to elicit the information. If a child starts to disclose, like in this case, there was a, a history of a question of whether her biological father, whose name is Lewis, versus her mom's boyfriend, Stephen, had possibly sexually abused her. Because she did make a disclosure um, a year or two earlier, it was inconclusive that in the actual interview, I don't know what you guys call it here, we call it a sane interview, at home where the DA's of CART yep, interview process. So being able to make sure that um, we pause the conversation, explain to the child that there's a coworker that we have at a different office who really wants to hear her talk about these things, to thank her for sharing what she shared so that she knows it's not her fault, that she did the right thing by sharing, finding out has she already told somebody else the information. You know, all your standard practices and approach to understanding sexual abuse, you want to make sure but the same thing happens here, right? So that, that we're able to kind of continue the normal steps we would take in our procedures. Um, but it is helpful to get it documented here in her own words. And that what I found and what workers have said is that parents are most motivated by seeing their children's pictures and words in order to affect change far more than anything some social worker is going to say to them. 
And so we've watched when the kids have shared it with the parents or the workers shared it with the parents, the emotional change that happens in the parents. People are crying. They're having that moment, that recognition of, wow, my behavior really does impact my kids. I'm fooling myself to think they slept through it, right? That's what we want. Other questions? Yep. How are uh, IR and ER workers putting their big toe in, in, the, the water. in the water to get started with this practice? You know, some of the ER workers are starting to say on their first visit when they're having the phone conversation to set up the time to come out. They're, well, first of all, they're doing less unannounced visits and saying, I, would, I want to come out tomorrow at 3 o'clock and I want you to have as many people who care about your family there. If you have anyone, a, a relative, a friend, a neighbor, somebody who you think really values the safety of, and well-being of your kids and family, I think it's a great idea for them to be present. And then you're having a conversation about all the things you would normally have it with, but they have brought people to the table to inform your assessment process. You're going to get a lot more information from three or four people at that conversation. Oh, by the way, at one home visit, you're not having to go back out or you're not having to make six extra phone calls when they're all right there. And you get an immediate visual of, did these people that came to the conversation present as safe people? Are they people we feel could be beneficial in her support system? Are they people who are going to look out for this kid or not? And if not, that's just information to help us recognize this family's going to have to do a heck of a lot more work, right? Because a lot of times their support people are people who are open consumers on other caseloads in our office, right? Or they all live in the same neighborhood or the same housing unit, right? So how do we, you know, figure out a way that if that's it, that's their support people, to get beyond that? Or in appropriate times, how do we use them to take good care of each other, right? Because if we're improving it on one case and it automatically approves it on another case, that's a good thing, right? Get their social worker at the table and let's figure out how we can do this. Yeah. And I think the other big thing is they're, they're willing to ask the three questions and try to do that quick three-column mapping with the family in their kitchen, right, so that they're getting a sense of what are the ways that they're actually already worried and they're on the same page with why we're involved. Make sense? And getting that danger statement, that's the other piece, that once they get that, and let's say the case is going to stay open and they pass it on to the next worker, when the next worker gets a clear danger statement that's already been shared with the family or that they can then share with the family, that's a good thing too. So I'm so sorry we've gone over time. I'm so grateful for your attention this morning. I know it's a lot of information, but we just want to keep exposing you to specific examples so that you can think about how you can apply it in your work. You're welcome. Hopefully I will see more of you throughout the next day and or two. Um, and if you have any other sidebar questions, just come find me on a break anytime. All right. Thanks.